All right, guys, we're back with Mr. Todd Driscoll, Texas Park and Wildlife. This is part four of our conversation about the tracking study at Toledo Bend. Now, Jake is doing this. Jake Norman's doing the same study at, at Fork. Are y'all seeing any? Are there any differences in the fish that you're seeing that is just remarkable to you between Toledo and Fork? You know, Jake and I haven't talked in tremendous detail about his fish versus my fish or Fork versus Toledo. Other than I know that uh, at least up to a few months ago, most of his fish were moving very little. They really were. He, he, he didn't have the 20% the, the or so of the fish that we've talked about individually that were doing crazy things. He just had not seen that up to a year and a half into the study. Now, over the last couple, three months, we have, haven't talked about it at all. Maybe he's seeing a little bit of that at this point, but... That strikes me odd, Todd, because it seems to me, from my experience, there's more fishing pressure on Fork than there is on Toledo, but maybe not because it's housing. Oh, no, I think you have it right. On a, on a per acre basis, oh, Fork's, you know, fishing pressure sky high, higher than Toledo for sure. So you would think his fish would do weirder stuff than your fish? Yeah, that would tend to make sense, but yeah, once again, they're, they're, they're just not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, once again, they they are fish and they do what they want to do. So, yeah. Are you guys? I'm sorry to. Are you guys going to write a, a paper on this, or what's going to be the final result of the study? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it'll be it'll be kind of a twofold deal. You know, we'll we'll write a a full fledged scientific manuscript. You know, where our peers will review it and it'll get published in a scientific journal because we're doing things that no one else has ever done before. You know, this, this uh, you know, boat effects and outboard motor and trolling motor noise, potential effects on, on bass has just never been done before. I mean, we essentially now with forward facing sonar live scope kind of have the tools to try to kind of pin that down to some degree. I mean, there's been studies done in general about a boat island back and forth. Does that affect a fish? Will it move away from it? There's been maybe one or two other studies done like that, but in terms of framing it around angling behavior, like we're doing. No one's ever done that before. So it'll be a neat scientific paper uh, publishing stuff that, that no one's really ever examined before. And then, you know, we'll do more of this kind of stuff, whether we write a, a layman's report or not, I don't know, but you know, we'll try to get word out with their overall findings for sure in, in, in media like this and, and others. Absolutely. By the way, guys, so if you haven't seen it, uh, Todd shared with me a, uh, a paper or I guess an article you wrote uh, specific to thermocline and that's posted on Ken Smith fishing, right? Kind of middle front first page. And it's a fascinating read because what I thought I knew about thermoclines was absolutely wrong. We're not going to get into that today, but that paper's out there. So second batch of fish, what should we right. talk about there, Todd? Right. 2021, uh, May, June timeframe. We, we tagged 17 total fish. Uh, we only had two of those die due to our surgeries. The, the strange thing is, though, that uh, over the course of the last eight or 10 months or so, we've had an additional six fish die of those fish we tagged that were not due to the surgeries, you know, most likely just due to natural causes. Uh, you know, if you just, you know, ballpark averages, a lot of anglers don't realize this, but uh, on average, adult bass, let's say, you know, 10, 12 inches or larger, on average, 20% of the adult bass population will, will die every year of just natural causes, you know, diseases, things of that nature. But having six of those fish die, I mean, that, that's 40% of our telemetered fish. So that was pretty high. We just really don't know why we had six die, that, but we did. So and none of them were angler harvested? No. No. Uh, well, we absolutely know they weren't, I guess not. I mean, we, the, the transmitters were still in the lake and they were beeping dead. That's what we know. And they could weren't beeping dead under a boat ramp where somebody had cleaned them. Right. Now, could have an angler have cleaned it and discarded the transmitter or the carcass and the, and the transmitter still be in the carcass and drift away? I guess that's possible. But, but my gut tells me no. Yeah. I just think these were natural mortalities for whatever reason. So what that means is, is we've had nine fish out of the second batch that we've tracked for the entire uh, time from last May till now. And those fish have been real reliable. We've been finding essentially all of those fish every time. And, and, and we hope all of them stay with us through, you know, May, June, July, when the batteries we expect them to run out. Any difference in 
the areas or the time of year the second batch of fish was caught versus the first batch of fish? No. No, and we, we intentionally tried to keep it similar so we yep. can pool the data. Yep. Now, obviously, what we were hoping to do is just have one batch of fish and follow them for over two years. That just can't happen due to the battery life. So we intentionally tried to keep the, the second batch as similar as the first so we could pool them. So 20% natural causes, what's the angular mortality rate or what, however you term that at Toledo Bend? You know, it's studies are, like that are so hard to do. You know, long-term Texas anglers, you, you may recall what we, we, we conducted one of the most comprehensive studies of your exact question at Sam Rayburn back in the mid-2000s. But to do that, what did we have to do? We had 50 to 60 of our inland fishery staff down here at Sam Rayburn for a full week and tagged, physically tagged 6,000 adult bass at Sam Rayburn to calculate what you just asked. Now, at Sam Rayburn, we found out that your fishing mortality in one year's time, at least for that year, was just 6%. Only 6% of the bass of legal size at Sam Rayburn in one year were killed. Only 34% of the bass of legal size were caught at all. So, But that's still a big number. One in three bass in Rayburn were caught? Yes. Now we'll that, never, we'll never have a data set like that again. I mean, that just, that was yeah. like a one in 50 years type study where it just timed out perfectly. We had the funds that the, 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 there was enough questions there. There was enough interest in, in, in parks and wildlife leadership to do it. So boom, we did it. Would we have loved to do the exact same thing at Toledo? We absolutely would have, but uh, it's just too, too, too time consuming manpower funding. What we, we anticipate Toledo behaves relatively similar to Sam Rayburn. We know the harvest rate over there is a little higher, but I still suspect that uh, the, the angler exploitation, that's what you ask, that's what biologists call it, the fishing mortality, the annual angler exploitation, what percent of illegal bass are caught or killed by anglers. It's still not just a huge percent at Toledo, I don't believe, just due to the vastness of the residue. So, and I, I'm, I'm going to get off topic here, and I may actually cut this out if it doesn't, if, if it's a dumb question. But when y'all did that study, you have to make an assumption of the total number of fish in the lake, right? We, yes, we, we at, at some level, we, we did calculate that. And it was based on historic, uh, what we call Cove Rote Known Surveys, where, you know, years ago, if you can believe this, then you'll understand why we don't do it anymore. You know, the only way for biologists to get, you know, fish counts on like a per acre basis is to literally block off a known area with a block net and kill what's inside there. Oh, okay. So on one hand, it gives you fish per acre. But on the other hand, again, you know why we don't do it anymore. I mean, we're not going to kill half acre coves out just to get that number. But we had that historic number from you know, 25, 30 years ago. So we used that to some degree, but the main number we used though was the 6,000 tagged fish we had. I mean, it's really no different than the 30 fish we have radio tagged, right? right? You just assume when you do your protocol right and you're not biased in the way you collect them, that you assume that those 30 or those 6,000 represent the population as a whole. You it's, know, the reason I asked that question is one of the things that had live scope having that specific tool on my boat has done to me is to realize the vast vast number of fish that are out just your word i think is pelagic just out there chasing balls of shad and some of them are great big ones oh yeah and, and i don't know that those could ever be counted in any kind of a krill survey right how do you know that i mean i idled over a spot the other day where there was a cloud of bait fish and there were five obvious big predator fish. They might not have been bass, but I'll bet they were set up on top of those bait fish. Yeah. Yeah. And if I recall off the top of my head, you know, those historic numbers 30 years or so ago, and I'd certainly suggest, I think at this point, you know, I really believe we have more adult fish in the lake now than we did then. Uh, I think the, the, the tournament statistics would suggest we do. Yes. The uh, if I recall, it was like 350,000 legal bass uh, 
you know, that would be, you know, around three, three or so adult bass per acre. Yeah. You know? So I, I expect that is higher now, but you know, that's just kind of a ballpark, you know, right. it kind of, kind of makes some sense. Okay. All right. I got a soft topic there. So we were talking about second group of fish. Yeah. As, as individuals, this second group of fish really has been pretty boring. Like I mentioned before, all of these fish, except two, they've stayed entirely within housing so far. And, and, and the two that moved out, one just moved out two weeks ago. The other one, I think back the first of November first moved out and then came right back in. So, uh, even more boring, even, even, even less movement. Uh, the two fish that moved out, they were just suspended on shad, kind of like what you mentioned a little bit earlier, just out in the middle of nowhere, out in deep water, you know, 30, 35 feet, you know, 15 feet down, just roaming around shad. But uh, overall, as individuals, pretty, pretty dang boring. They, they really were. Okay. All right, so let's talk about overall observations of what what you would yeah how the fish react to boats all all that good stuff yeah so you know everything pulled together you know we essentially had around 30 individual fish that we had at least five recorded locations on or more and some of these fish you know we had you know 25 or 30 different locations going going over there and finding them every two weeks so you pull all this together and we, we have 409 individual fish locations so we spent a bunch of time over there running around looking for these fish that's for sure and, and remember you know one of the reasons that, that we were doing this is to see whether there's a proportion of the bass population whether intentionally or unintentionally whether they get away from nearly all angling pressure and the main way i define that anyway is just simply by water depth right i, I think most of us would agree uh, depths of 30 or 35 feet or less. I think that's where, where most of us spend most of our time. I mean, there's exceptions to that with forward facing sonar and fishing for suspended fish now, but for the most part, the vast majority of us really don't think much, at least around Toledo Bend or Sam Rayburn of going out past about 35 feet of water. So with that said, 409 fish locations only three of these locations out of that over 400 have been located in water deeper than 40 feet. Three out of over 400, that is it. One was in 46 feet, one in 56, and one in 58. And those fish, any way to know where those fish were in the water column? Well, you know, you just have to make some assumptions, right? You know, when we pull up to a, to a bass, it's hard to know, particularly when, when a fish is in a school of, let's say, five or 10 other bass, is that one of our bass that we're seeing on scope or could there be, could our bass be on the bottom right there? We don't necessarily 100% know that, but you just have to make some assumptions. You know, when, when, when I see five or six or seven suspended bass around shad, I'm just assuming one of those fish is ours yep. and it's not hunkered down to the bottom. That's just, that's just what we have to assume. So, you know, what's those. The deepest, what's the deepest you've caught a bass, Todd, off the bottom? Well, if you let me go go up to Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence River. <laughs> Rayburn or Toledo. Okay. 58 feet. And that you was a spotted a bass. bass. Wow. Spotted bass in 58. And, and I think my second deepest is, you know, true depth-wise, bottom was 42 feet. Okay. A large amount. Yes. Yeah, mine's 36. So I was just curious. Yeah. And it was a big school of four and five pound fish. We... We had 28 pounds that day, so. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I think how many other fish have I caught deeper than 40? I don't know that I have. So, you know, my experience mirrors yours pretty much. I mean, again, 35 feet or less, you know, that's where, where, where most of the action happens. Right. So, yeah. you know, these, the, these fish we have tagged at Toledo in terms of water depth, they're not getting away from us for the most part. They're just not. So, uh, you know, just three times out of 400, that's all. So, uh, but the was, biggest fish is either the smartest or the spookiest. I'm sorry, say again. The biggest fish, the nine pounder, she is either the smartest or the spookiest in, in relation to angler pressure. Yeah, you know, pretty much. And here's how I've told several people you know, the person that's going to 
uh, stumble into that fish? Is that person that's that, that's more of a novice or a beginner, or maybe doesn't have all the latest greatest electronics? He just launches at a Jack's 944 boat ramp back there, idles around the point, and just drifts with a Carolina rig on that flat out there. That's how that fish is going to get caught. Yep. So, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, and you and I've talked, you know, off camera a little bit about about the number of fish we saw on these flats. And again, that was one of the more eye-opening things that, that we did see. But, but if you want to, we, we can move into the movement. I'd love to. Just overall movement of these fish. Again, I've already talked about, you know, majority of our fish just not doing a whole lot. Well, we're actually, you know, measuring the movement. Actually, let's stop right there. Okay. That'll be video four. We'll come right back with video five and we'll talk about the movement. Okay. 